This Parsha podcast is dedicated in loving memory and Le'ilu Nishmas Gershon Ben Charles. Gershon is the father of our dear friend, Adam Chakro. May his soul be elevated in heaven. We are approaching the end of the calendar year. And it's the time for that gentle nudge, that gentle, loving Parsha podcast nudge. As you know, we have a big fundraising drive to support the great work of Torch. Every year we do it only once, towards the beginning of the year, February or March, maybe January. And that's our bargain. We ask all of y'all once a year to support. And if everyone gives what they can give, then we will be able to continue to do the great work of our organization, Torch, the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. The great work of the Parsha podcast and the many other themes we got going on over here. We are going, I have to tell you, through somewhat of a rough financial patch, a minor crunch. We need your help. So if you have not yet given, submitted your donation to Torch for 2023, visit the website. You can find it in the description of every single podcast, torchweb.org. Pitch in, help support the great work of Torch and the Parsha podcast. Now, if you have given, there are no rules against giving a bit more. We surely can use it. Torchweb.org, that's the website. And of course, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. So we have the reunion in our Parsha. The brothers are getting back together. The twins are reuniting for a bit. After 34 years of separation, after Jacob usurps the blessings from his brother, Esav wants to kill him. Rebecca and Isaac, they send Jacob away, go to Haran, go marry one of Laban's daughters. He marries both of them in the end, or really or f- all four, because Bila and Zilpah were also daughters of Laban. He stops off along the way, spends 14 years in study, as Rashi tells us. Seven years to marry Rachel, he ends up with Leah. We know that story. Another seven years to marry Rachel. After 14 years, he works for pay for an additional six years, for a total of 20. So 14 plus seven, seven, and six. It's 34 years. The brothers have not seen seen each other. I'm sure they sent postcards and uh, Thanksgiving cards. But now it's time for them to get back. And Jacob sends messengers. And they tell him, we have bad news. Asaph is still hell-bent on revenge. The 34 years have done nothing to dissipate his anger. So Jacob prepares his camp. Rashi tells us he does three things. He begins a bribe, an epic bribe of appeasement. He prays and he prepares for war. Before he meets Esau, he first has an encounter with the angel of Esau. They have a long nocturnal struggle. It's a stalemate. The angel sees that he cannot overcome Jacob. He instead aims for below the belt. He dislodges his hip bone. Then Jacob refuses to send him away unless he gets a blessing. He blesses him by renaming him Israel, Yisrael. That name will be reaffirmed by God towards the end of the Parsha. And finally, he encounters Asaph. And he arranges the camp in the proper configuration. He bows seven times. He meets Asaph. Asaph is all surprised at the size of the camp. When Jacob left, he was penniless. He was alone. Now he has four wives and 12 children and an enormous camp, lots of wealth. They have a discussion back and forth. Jacob says, I have everything I need. Esav responds, Yeshli Rav Achi, my brother, I have a lot. And they ultimately amicably depart. Jacob is able to avoid catastrophe. Before Esav leaves, he says, let's go together. And that is another thing that Jacob was worried about. And he says, oh, I'll get to you. You go to Mount Seir and I'll catch up to you. I'll go slowly. I don't want to go too fast. He's able to wiggle out of that problem as well. I want to examine this encounter at the beginning of our parsha when, when Jacob met Asaph 
and we'll do it in the dad way. That's the theme of year eight of the Parsha podcast. Go go a bit deeper, deep and a bit deeper. And by the way, call your dad if you are lucky enough to have one. Call dad and tell him you love him and mom too as well. This is a message sanctioned by the Parsha podcast and the Torch Center. What happens? Jacob and Esav meet. Jacob had been preparing for it. He set up the camp. He divided it to two. In case Esav comes and destroys one camp, the other one will survive. He sent an incredible cavalcade of, of gifts to Esav. He prayed. He finally encounters him in the beginning of chapter 33 of our book, Genesis. He arranges at the camp. And then as he's approaching his brother, he bows seven times. Chapter 33, verse 3, he bows seven times. It's a bit baffling. Why is Jacob bowing before Esau seven times? I want to examine this and develop from this idea, maybe a core principle in the encounter of Jacob and Esau, and see what we can learn from it for ourselves. So I will tell you that some of the commentaries talk about it, and they say, well, Jacob was conveying a message to his brother. The verse tells us, Sheva yipol tzadik for come, the righteous one falls seven times, and they still get up. Maybe Jacob is teaching his brother a lesson or trying to convey to him a message. Yes, you may knock me down once, twice, even seven times, but I will always rise again. That's an idea featured in many of the commentaries. It's featured in the Midrash as well. I want to talk about a different approach to understand the seven bows of Jacob. There was another instance in our literature of seven bows. We bow, of course, in our prayer, we bow, but we bow four times in the prayer. Seven bows is not something which appears in many places in our philosophy or literature. But it does in one place in the Talmud. In the book of Kiddushin on page 29b, the context of the Talmud is very interesting. The Talmud is talking about the responsibilities that a father has towards his son and vice versa. And it says, let's say there's only enough money to pay for the tuition of one of the father or son, either the father or the son, for the tuition in the yeshiva. Who comes first? You can only afford to send one of them to the yeshiva, the father or the son. Of course, the father has a responsibility to study Torah himself. He also has the responsibility to teach his son. So you have dueling responsibilities, and you can only do one. Which one has precedence? So Talmud says, well, it depends. If the son is preternaturally gifted, then the son goes first. Otherwise, the father goes first. And it tells us a story of one of the great sages. His name was Rav Acha Bar Yaakov, Rav Acha, the son of Yaakov, Jacob. And he had only money for one tuition. And he said, I'll, I'll send my son. I'll send my son. So his son goes to the yeshiva to study in the academy of Abaya. But when he gets there, it turns out that the son is not so sharp. The son's not so sharp. And the father says, you know what? You're obviously not learning, you're not studying on the way, on the level, on the degree that warrants that I allow you to go first. Therefore, I'm going to supplant you. So I'm going to go join the yeshiva. So the the rabbi, Rav Acha Bar Yaakov, says, you, you stay here. You take over my responsibilities in the house, and I will swap places with you in the yeshiva. Now, Rav Acha Bar Yaakov is a very famous rabbi, and he's someone that was able to do miracles. So when Abaya, the head of the academy, when he hears that, oh, we have a visitor coming, Rav Acha Bar Yaakov is coming to visit, he says, oh, we, we have an opportunity here. Let's not miss the opportunity. Because 
in the study hall, there was a monster. Oh, there was a monster. Okay. A demon. There was a demon in the study hall, says the Talmud. And it was a ferocious demon. Even if there were two people coming to the academy, to the study hall, and even during the day, the demon would attack them. Usually the demons are more powerful at night. And they usually don't attack two people. They only attack loners, people going on their own. But this was, uh, this, this demon, this monster was so aggressive and so dangerous and so potent that even during the day and even two people, it would attack. Okay, we have a problem. So Abayi says, I, I can't really solve this demon problem, but you know who could? Rav Achabar Yaakov, the father coming to swap places with his son. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to deny Rav Achabar Yaakov a place to stay. No one invite him to stay in your house. He'll be forced to go to the academy. That's the only place that's open. Where are you going to sleep at night? He'll go, he'll just stay in the academy. Stay in the study hall. And then the demon will attack him. And because Rav Achim Yaakov is so gifted and so righteous and so capable of doing miracles, he'll be able to eliminate this demon that's causing so much problems. Okay, so that's what happened. Rav Acha Bar Yaakov comes and uh, no one invites him to stay at their house. So he has no choice but to spend the night in the study hall. And who shows up? The demon. And it has a very strange look, very strange appearance, the Talmud tells us. It's like a serpent with seven heads. Now a serpent... That's pretty terrifying. Some people like snakes. Not me. Some people are more terrified of public speaking than snakes. Not me. I'll, I'll speak. No problem. No snakes. Even worms. No worms. But even the people that are brave enough to play with snakes, if it has seven heads, mm, I think even the uh, serpent lovers may may want to abstain from that. This is a terrifying thing. Rav Acha, Bar Yaakov, is in the study hall, and now he's being attacked by this demon, which appears to be like a serpent with seven heads. So what does he do? He starts, he starts to pray. And he starts to bow. And every time he bows, in submission to God, one of the demon's heads gets lopped off. And he bows seven times, says the Talmud. And all seven heads are lopped off. The demon has been eliminated. And the Talmud ends with the epilogue. What happened the next day? Rav Acha says, that was very clever of y'all, but a miracle happened. And if there was no miracle, I would have been in danger. Okay, so this is a teaching in the Talmud, story in the Talmud. It's important to note that this is an agadic teaching in the Talmud, or at least it seems like it is agadic, which means that it might not be literal. That's a subject for a different time. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But there's some sort of message here. We see the seven-headed monster, the seven-headed serpent that Rav Acha Bar Yaakov is fending off and he's bowing down seven times. And with each time, one of the heads is removed is decapitated. The commentaries tell us that there's an overlap between these two stories, Jacob bowing down seven times before he confronts, he encounters Esav. And this Rav Acha Bar Yaakov, he bowing down seven times before God and lopping off a head per bow to eliminate it. The commentaries tell us that Esav was a monster. And he was a monster with seven heads, with seven different dimensions, with seven different elements. And one of the ways that Jacob approached him, he sought to neutralize him element by element, head by head, 
each of these bows. He just bowing. The verse tells us he bows. Why is he doing that? In the same way that Rav Acha Bar Yaakov was bowing seven times to eliminate the seven elements of this demon, that's what Jacob was doing. And they explain, Esav is the embodiment of the Yetzirah. And the angel of Esav, the Samach Mem, the Uncle Sam that we talked about uh, recently in the podcast, he is the angel of death. And the Talmud says the angel of death and the Yetzirah are the same thing. It's just two different elements of the same thing. So Esav is the Yetzirah. And the Yetzirah we're told in the Talmud, has seven different names. What that means is, each name represents a different element, a different dimension, a different facet of this monster. And Esav symbolizes the Eitzaran, and thus it has seven elements to it. And just as Rav Acha Yaakov bowed down seven times in prayer to God to eliminate the seven heads of this serpent, Jacob did the same. He wasn't bowing to Ace of the commentaries point out. If you read the verse very critically, it does not say that he bowed before Ace of, he bowed to Ace of. He bowed before Ace of. And the commentaries note, many of them do, that he was actually bowing to God. That was a form of prayer about Esau, and he did it seven times because he needed seven things from God to eliminate the danger, the sevenfold danger of Esau. Now you'll notice when Jacob and Esau, when they start talking, and Jacob says, I have I have everything that I need. And Esau says, Yesh li rav achi, I have a lot, my brother. The Kabbalists note that this is maybe a subtle reference, a hidden reference to the events of the Talmud of Rav Acha. The word Rav means a lot, but the word Rav also means rabbi. And this sage in the Talmud that's bowing down seven times to lop off the the seven heads of the monster in the Academy of Abai, his name is Rav Acha. And what does Esav say? He says Rav Achi. The Kabbalists tell us that there's a little bit of a subtle reference here. Oh, and Rav Acha, the sage who went overnight to the academy, he's Bar Yaakov, the son of Yaakov. He's a descendant of Yaakov. What's happening here is the same thing. Jacob is showing us that when you have a seven-headed monster, the Yitzhara, you bow seven times before God and you eliminate it. And Rav Acha, whose name is literally named after the statement of Esav, when he was neutralized by Jacob, he's told Bar Yaakov, the descendant of Jacob, he's the one who learned from Jacob how to engage with the seven-headed monster. Okay, what do we have over here? Esav represents the Yetzirah. Eight the Yetzirah has seven names. That is featured in the Talmud, the book of Sukkah on page 52a. And those seven names are, number one, Ra, evil. Number two, Arel uncircumcised. Number three, tame, impure. Number four, sone, hater. Number five, michshol, a stumbling block. Number six, evan, a stone. Number seven, sphoni, something which inhabits a person internally, which is maybe not the best way to translate. Sophon means it's hidden within. If the Talmud tells us that there are seven names for the eight Sahara, it means that there are seven elements for the eight Sahara. And if Jacob bowed seven times before Esau, bowed to God seven times before Esau, it's because he was trying to address the seven different elements of Esau. Now, Esau, the first things that we know about Esau, the very first things that we're told about him, is that he was ruddy and he was full of hair. He was hairy. The word hairy, as in full of hair, in Hebrew is se'ar. Kuluka does se'ar. The verse says he was completely covered in hair, like a cloak full of hair. Where did Esav live? He lived in Mount Seir. 
That's the name of the place. It means a hair. Mount of hair. Asaph is very hairy. Oh, and the Talmud, when the Talmud talks about the future event, we've spoken about this in many different podcasts over the years. The Talmud says that in the future, the Almighty will take the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, and slaughter it before the righteous and before the wicked. To the righteous, it will appear to be a mountain. To the wicked, it will appear to be a hair. Mountain, hair. Har, seir. Where does, where does Esav live? Mount Seir, the mountain of hair. Esav is the Yetzirah. He is hairy. That's one of the names of the Yetzirah. He lives on the mountain of hair. That's the Yetzahara. Yes, Esav is the embodiment of the Yetzahara. And he has seven names, the Yetzahara. Oh, and by the way, the Talmud tells us, this is in the book of Erevin on page 19a, that Gehenom Purgatory also has seven names. There are seven facets of the Yetzahara, and capitulating to the Yetzahara will result in seven facets of purgatory. A couple of years ago, in a Parsha podcast quite incomparably titled Death Row and Jethro, one of my favorite titles of a podcast, this one, the one you're listening to, might rival it. In that podcast, we pointed out that Jethro had seven names as well. And we theorized that Jethro is such a hero because he triumphed over all seven facets of the Yetzirah. And every time he leveled up, he defeated another element of the Yetzirah, he was granted another name. Now, I have a, a little bit of a pet theory that I'm working on. It's a, it's a stub of an idea. And I have a sense that there's something there. And I actually chatted about it with, uh, with my brother-in-law, Rabbi Botnik. He loved it as well, but it's still in the germination stages. To me, it seems like there's more than one villain in the Torah. And as many times we've seen, we saw this already a few weeks ago, that the individuals in the Torah on a deeper level, on maybe the level of allegory, we spoke about how, how lot on the level of allegory is the Yitzhara. And Jacob has to contend with Laban for 20 years, and that's symbolic of the Yitzhara. And the Rambam has the famous essay where he talks about how Pharaoh is symbolic of the Yitzhara. And Ishmael is another Villain. And next week's partial will read about the wife of Potiphar, Miss Potiphar, and she too is a villain. I had this sense that we can make a list maybe of seven villains in the Torah, and each one of them will really symbolize one of these seven elements of the Yetzahara. And I even speculated, I started to make a list of the seven villains, and I found examples, you know, Lot. It says that he went to Sodom and Gomorrah, which was evil. So to me, like if one of the names of the Yitzhara is evil, maybe Lot is more symbolic of that element of the Yitzhara. Oh, and one of the names of the Yitzhara is stone. And the verse that it quotes is that God will remove the stone heart. How do you say stone heart in Hebrew? Lev, stone, evan, of stone. If you take the word lev, evan, and you just merge it into one, you have lavan, laban. Maybe laban symbolizes that element of the Yetzahara. Oh, and Pharaoh, he was stricken with with a plague when he kidnapped, when he assaulted Sarah. So maybe Pharaoh symbolizes this idea of impurity and so on. But now I think, just thinking more about this, this is again, this is just a side point. Esav, Esav encapsulates them all. Jacob bows seven times to Esav because Esav is the Alpha Yetzahara. He incorporates within him all seven dimensions. And this is a concept we see in other places in our philosophy. For example, the four exiles. We talk about this in many places in our literature and philosophy. 
the nation will have to endure four exiles, one in Babylon, one in Persia and Media, and one in Greece. And finally, the last one, the longest one, is Edom, is Asaph. And that's so difficult, so maddeningly difficult, because it incorporates all the negative characteristics of all the preceding three. And it seems interminable. This is all a long way of saying that the encounter of Jacob with his brother on a deeper level, it's really about the meeting of the soul and the Yitzhahara, of the righteous soul and the terrible danger that it must face when it's attacked by the seven-headed monster. Of course, we know that the deeds of the fathers, of the patriarchs, they're important for the children. They're instructive for the children. If the story of Jacob and Asaph was just about a meeting of two brothers in the past, there's no reason why 3,500 years later we should be reading about it every year. But if this is also symbolic for us about how we have to encounter with our villains and on a spiritual level, the villain that we all must face off against is the Yetzahara. It's very important for us to study exactly what Jacob did to prepare and how he navigated this crisis. We all have to face off against the seven-headed monster. All of us. Up to the times of Messiah. All of us have to face off against the Yetzara. And Jacob is going to give us a master class in how to do that properly. So what does he do? The first thing he does is he prepares. How does he prepare? Three things with prayer, with a bribe, and with war. We pray every morning that God saves us from the Sahara. And there are many times throughout our prayer, our daily repeating prayer, that we're mentioning the danger of the Sahara. Jacob prepared with prayer for his encounter with Asaph. We must prepare with prayer with our encounter with our seven-headed monster. He also sent a, a bribe, a gift, that is a very powerful tool to redirect the Sahara. It's okay to throw him a bone. This is an idea we've spoken about many times on the podcast. You could bribe the Sahara. You could appease it. You find some way to get it on board. When you bribe someone, they become blinded. They cannot find anything negative about you. If you bribe the judge, you bribe the legislator, that would never happen, of course. Not in these United States. Never! Never! To to bribe a public official who swore a sacred oath to the Constitution? Never happened, right? Of course. But in other places. Of course, other places like South America. I don't know. It's so corrupt. Here, it's just way above that it's just <laughs> everyone's caring about the interests of the of the public you could bribe someone and that changes their perception you could bribe the Sahara. and there's an art to know how to do that to find a way to make the Sahara supportive of the agenda going against the Yitzhara. I spoke about this in my book, Upon a Ten-Stringed Harp, which I'm sure all of y'all have read a few times, cover to cover. My friend Paul told me that he, he read it six times. And my friend Adam told me that he's, I think, on his fourth reading. So I'm sure all of y'all have read it so many times already. But if you, if you don't remember, I'll just rejigger your memory. We have a part of the book dedicated to how to fight the Yitzhara. And one of the ideas that we mentioned is that there's a way to cause the Yitzhara 
to support your agenda against it. And the way you do that is you bribe it. You link something that it wants with something that you want. I will have a big ice cream once I finish this page of Talmud. Yitzhar does not want you to study Talmud, but it really, really, really wants the ice cream. When you link the two together, you're forcing the Sahara to join you in pursuit of the agenda that goes against the Sahara, namely the study of the page of Talmud. That's an example. There are many examples of it. The example the Talmud brings is that a person has an interest that they want. They have an agenda item that they want. Even the Sahara would support. And they linked that with their charitable gift. I am giving this charitable gift in order to get X, Y, and Z, in order that uh, my team wins the Super Bowl, which is unfortunately an experience that uh, for us Houstonians is still a dream, a still a distant dream. Now, for our sizable international audience, the Super Bowl is like the World Series, no, like the World Cup of American football played with an oblong little pit stain kind of thing, matriculating the ball down the field. Okay. You want your team to win. The eights are out wants you to be super involved in sports and all sorts of other things that make you forget about where your soul is going to after it leaves this world. And you say, I want to give some charity in the merit of something that the HRR really wants. Suddenly the HRR is like torn. Oh, oh, I have a problem. I got to support the charity. And that is bribing the HRR. That is persuading it, forcing it, handcuffing it to support your agenda. Very clever. Give Asaph all these things that he wants. He, he just, he can't fight you anymore. And finally, prepare for war. What does that mean? To tenaciously, aggressively, incessantly fight against its agenda. Straight up. May the best man win. I'm committed to it. I'll fight you to the death over it. If someone gives the Yitzra all you got, you'll win. Jacob is preparing for war against the seven-headed monster, the same way that we must do in our war, an hour encounter against our seven-headed monster. I'll tell you something really cool. Very cool. A Parsha podcast special. Jacob prepared for his encounter by doing two things. Rashi tells us this is in chapter 32, verse 9. He prepared with, with three things. Ladorum with a gift, Tvila, prayer, and Milchama, and war. If you go back to chapter 18 of Genesis, this is after Abraham fed the three travelers who were really angels masquerading as weary travelers. And then they're heading off and Abraham accompanies them. And then God says, well, how can I withhold from Abraham? After all, Abraham's going to train his children. He'll be righteous and do justice. And he tells them about the plan for Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham launches into a salvo of prayer. And the verse says, this is chapter 18, verse 23. Vayigash Avraham, and Abraham approached. What does it mean that Abraham approached? And Rashi says, three things. He approached for war. He approached for appeasement. He approached for prayer. The very same three things that Jacob did to prepare for his encounter with Esau, that's the same way that Abraham prepared for his intercession on behalf of Sodom, of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's interesting. And what it means, it's not so clear, it's just an observation. But maybe what this tells us is that even though Abraham was on the other side of the religious, spiritual, and theological divide, as the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, he was as committed in saving them as Jacob was in sparing his family. That's one way to take this observation. 
On our level, on our homiletical interpretation here, that when we see the commentaries tell us that Esav is really an embodiment of, Yitz, of the Yitzhah and it's got seven elements, he bows seven times, like Rav Acha Bar Yaakov. Maybe what this means is that the Yitzhah presents itself as an ally. I, I have your best interest at heart. Come here. What can I offer you? What do you like? I will make your life better. But ultimately, it is sending the person in the way of destruction, the lights of which were seen in the times of Sodom and Gomorrah. So this is lesson number one, how Jacob prepared for his war. Before he actually meets Esav, he meets the angel of Esav. And they have a battle the whole night. So, of course, this tells us that however you interpret the story here, it's clearly not simply a physical encounter. Now, the verse says, Ishimo, a man struggled with him. Man, Rashi tells us that's the angel of Esav. They struggled. But the word Vayi'avet means to, to, to contend, to struggle, to wage a, a, a war, a, a, a skirmish. But the word Vayi'avet also means avat, which means dust. And the Midrash tells us that the dust, the dust of this struggle, it ascended all the way to the heavenly throne. Now, what does that mean? And what does that teach us? If you want cover, if you want to obscure, you want to create a barrier, what you do is you create a, if there's a dust storm, right? If there's a dust storm, there's very low visibility. Jacob is waging war against against Esav, but really the representation here, certainly when, when it's the angel of Esav, it's the Yitzharah, it's the Satan, it's the angel of death, that's the angel of Esav. How does this struggle endanger us? There's dust, and the dust ascends all the way to heaven. It ascends all the way to the heavenly throne, says the Midrash. The Yetzirah tries to blind us and to make us miss and, and not see the most important thing. It obfuscates the throne of God from us. And we fail to see, to appreciate, to recognize the Almighty. That is the essence of what the Yetzirah is trying to do to us to make this dust, this obfuscation, all the way up to the throne of God. Esav's grandson is a man named Amalek. That's not just a coincidence that he shares the name with the villainous people that are always trying to undermine us. Esav's grandson is the progenitor of Amalek. Amalek is the most dangerous and, and potent element of Esav. And the verse tells us that so long as Amalek exists, the throne of God is not complete. God's presence in the world is obfuscated by this dust storm, this sandstorm that's ascending and obfuscating and covering and concealing the throne of God. Remember we talked about the angel, Uncle Sam, Samach Mem, the way it's spelled, Samach Mem Aleph Lamed. Something really cool, a little bit inside baseball here. The Kliyakar, one of the commentaries, he, he points out that if you follow the system of the letters, and you just go to the next letter in the Torah with the word Samach Mem Aleph Lamed. Samach comes after Samach. After Samach, 
comes Ayin. And after Mem comes Nun. So Ayin Nun. And after Aleph comes Bez. So Ayin Nun Bez. And after Lamed comes Mem. There's a system of letters where you look at one word and then you take the next letter of, or the next letter in the order of the alphabet, in the order of the alph base, and you just make a word out of the next set of letters. So if there's, if there's four letters in the word Samach Mem, you take the next four letters of each successive letter. I don't know if this makes any sense. <laughs> and, uh, and then you spell out another word. So the word Samach Mem, Samach Mem Alf Lamed, will result in Ein Nun Beis Mem, which means Anavim, which means grapes, which means wine. The outgrowth, the thing that follows from Samach Mem is wine is Drunkenness. Just as wine causes opacity and obfuscation and a lack of clarity, I've been very reliably told. Not much of a, not much of a drinker myself. That is what flows from the Samach Mem. And a person could be blind and they could be staggering about like an inebriated man. And they fail to see, they fail to see the throne of God. They fail to appreciate and recognize and submit themselves to the dominion of the Almighty. The Samach Mem causes spiritual drunkenness. And that's why it's called the foreign God, because it obfuscates the real one. But Jacob's able to overcome this. The obfuscation doesn't work. And the angel wants to leave. I give up. You won. You outlasted me. You won. And what does Jacob tell the angel? He says, what's your name? What's your name, O angel? Jacob's all polite here. He's meeting someone. What's your name? He doesn't say that at the beginning of the night. He says it in the morning. And the angel responds, maybe a bit rudely. Why are you asking my name? What's happening over here? The angel seems to be very rude to Jacob. Jacob is asking a very legitimate question. What is your name? And he responds, Don't, why are you asking my name? There's a very deep point over here. What is the name of this Yetzahara? It has a funny name. Its name is, don't ask my name. That is his name. He, he actually responded to Jacob. Why are you asking my name? That's the name. The essence of the Yetzirah is that it's trying to hide and it's trying to quell and squelch any investigation into its identity. Part of the power of the Yetzirah is that it's, it's, it's hiding in plain sight. And its essence is, don't ask my name. Don't investigate. Don't look into it. Don't try to find out what it is and where its vulnerabilities lie and where its dangers lie. And what happens if you capitulate to it? The essence of the Yetzara, the name of it, maybe this is an eighth name, is that it's trying to hide and to evade having names placed upon it. If you realize the Yetzara is is evil, is impure, is a stone, is all the seven names of the Talmud, you want no part of it. That sounds like a terrible thing. And you realize that, the, well, the seven names for Gehenim, because that's what happens. You'll have to be cleansed in purgatory for each of these seven elements that you capitulate to. When you do realize its name, it's, it's not as desirous. It's not as covetous as it may seem initially. But it has another name. And its name is, don't, what, don't ask my name. Another element of it, concealing before us, Making the whole subject not as interesting to us. Don't ask my name. Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> okay, I won't investigate. And it can continue to wreak havoc, to cause all sorts of damage to people. 
Jacob was aware of it. And he addressed it. And he modeled for us what it takes to bow before God, to submit yourself to God and not to the false God. Seven times. To wage war on all seven dimensions. To pray for all seven dimensions. To appease on all seven dimensions. I'll tell you one more cool thing. At the end of our parsha, the whole chapter 36 is dedicated towards the delineation of the various tribes and chieftains and leaders and kings of Asaph. And next week's parsha begins. So we're Vayeshlach now. Next week is Vayeshev. It says that Vayeshev Yaakov, Jacob, dwelt. And Rashi, it's a very famous Rashi, where Rashi says that the juxtaposition between the end of this week's parsha of Vayishlach and the beginning of next week's parsha, it's, it's not a coincidence. Jacob sat, meaning like he had to deal, he had to contend with the fact that Asaph had such a formidable army to support him. And Jacob was like, how, how am I going to overcome this? And the next verse, the second verse of Netri's Parsha says that the descendants of Jacob were Joseph. How do we overcome the severely imposing armies of Esau with Joseph? And Rashi, Rashi tells us that Esau is really like a paper tiger. It's just like a, a bunch of hay or a bunch of flax. And one little spark comes from, from, from Joseph and that incinerates, engulfs the entirety of Esau. And that's why Jacob was able to relax almost. He was calm because he had the foil for Esav. He had Joseph. Esav is, is very imposing, but just one little flicker that emanates from, from Joseph, that little spark, and Esav is, is highly combustible, and it will just be completely consumed by the fire. It's very interesting. Jacob, his life story is that he, he has this brother, problematic brother, and he's dealing with him, and he's dealing with him, and he's dealing with him, and then he has to escape. He was forced to steal the blessings. He has to escape. And he deals with another villain, Laban. And he leaves Laban. Laban pursues. And it takes a long time until they're able to amicably depart. And he leaves Laban and goes to Asaph. And again, there's multiple layers of attack. He meets the angel of Asaph, and then he meets Asaph himself, and he has to be vigilant on all fronts. And then they depart. All's well, right? That's his parsha. You imagine we're done with Asaph. We've we've finished with him. We've defeated that problem. That threat has been eliminated. Esav is resolved. But the truth is, Esav is never resolved. It's always on the table. Esav is the Yitzhahara. Until Messiah comes, if we're still in this arena, we have to contend with Esav. So yes, it may look like you've defeated it, the very first thing we hear about after Esav is, oh, we're still ready for him. We still have this ace up our sleeves. We have Joseph who can defeat it. When does this all end? It ends with Messiah. The last battle is against Esav. Until Messiah is here, Jacob is not finished with his battle. Esav cannot be fully decapitated until Messiah comes. And the force of Messiah that eliminates Esau is known as Messiah ben Joseph. Messiah who emanates from Joseph. And of course, this is a much bigger idea and it's a, a, a concept that we talk about more on the Torah 101 podcast, which I'm sure all of y'all are subscribers to. And if you're not, 
do me a favor, listen to one episode of the Torah 101 podcast and you will be able to determine very quickly if it's for you or not. And I'm very confident that you will enjoy it and become a big fan of it. Because we deal with all sorts of very fundamental elements of our philosophy, our belief, the, the tenets of Judaism in a very rigorous, comprehensive, but also entertaining way. Not as entertaining as the Parsha podcast, but still entertaining, stimulating, intriguing. Joseph is always needed. On the other side of the Jordan, when you have two tribes who want to settle there, Reuven and, and Dad, they always have to have a representative of Joseph. Half of Manasseh has to be there. You always have to have Joseph with you. Because you never know when Asaph is going to spring up and when you may need to once again wage war against Asaph, who you thought you departed from. You thought you walked away from him. No, no, no. This, this battle never ends. This is what we're here to do. Jacob is the poster boy. He goes from Asaph to Laban, Laban again, Asaph multiple times, and then he tries to relax a little bit, and then he's got to deal with, with Pharaoh. It doesn't end. That's what we're here to do. We're here. Our mission in life is to overcome the Yitzhara. It's not a one and done. And the Yitzhara's got seven elements, seven-headed monster, and it's a serpent. And because of the sin of Adam and Eve, we have the consequences of the serpent. The eight stars within us. And we cannot eliminate this completely so long as we are here. Even though, if you read my book, Upon a Ten String Tarp, you know that there were three, four, maybe five people who did eliminate the Yetzirah. Sahara. Those are the absolute giants of our history. This is what it's all about. This is our enemy. And we need to overcome it. And now Jacob shows us how to do it. This is a bit of a deeper take on the encounter of Jacob and Esau and the lessons that we can learn. And that's what we're trying to do here on the Parsha Bajas, year eight. It's year eight. We're veterans here. We've been doing this for a while. Yes, it's still awkward to be in a room by yourself with a microphone and just talk. I need like a, like a show observer. Someone on the other side of the glass that can nod and give me the thumbs up and listen in on the headphones and know when I'm going off the rails and ram me back in. But alas, it's just me. It's just me in this madness here in the Torch Center. But I think uh, I think we got a little bit of a deeper look. Went a bit deeper. Into Parshas Vayishlach, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your support. I appreciate your listenership. Spread the word of the Parsha podcast to your friends, to your family. I haven't said this in a long time. Give us a good rating. Subscribe. What else are you supposed to say? Subscribe. Hit the bell. Okay. Subscribe. Hit the bell. Five-star rating. Give a nice review. What else? What else? Oh, send me an email. RabbiWallBitchim.com As I mentioned at the top, if you haven't made your 2023 donation to Torch, now's the time. It's the end of the year, and we really need your support. Until next week, have a wonderful day. Have an uplifting and invigorating and exciting and enjoyable Shabbos. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we will talk again next week, hopefully with good news from our brethren in Israel and our brethren worldwide. And again, that email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com.